Kim's going to come and share with us this morning and we've been thinking of you this week. But, you know, I don't know if anyone saw that photo that went up on social media of Kim and Beth. It was a good-looking couple. I don't think we have it, but, you know, it was a good-looking couple. Beautiful smiles. Kim, we love when you speak. You're fun and engaging. You challenge us. You just bring practical, everyday reality that encourages us to love others and love Jesus. So, Thank you. I think I might need to borrow Jared's glass case of emotion over there and just <laughs> cry in the corner. <laughs> what a church, hey, I, I love this place and I think you'll hear as this message develops that I have such a deep love for this church, especially the last year, it's been a tricky year, but I've been part of this place for over 20 years and I've met some amazing people, I've formed some amazing friendships and I look at my kids now as they grow up and they form friendships and I pray that they too would experience the love of Jesus through this church more and more and th through their friends. And, and I don't know about you, but I feel like we just need to give the most massive cred to our leaders, Jeff and Carolyn, who <laughs> emphasise relationships. <laughs> just place an emphasis on a safe place to experience Jesus. So... Thank you guys so much for all you do. As I said, I've been part of this place for over 20 years now and this coming Saturday I'm going to be celebrating my 38th birthday. And we're doing it by celebrating Beth's favourite band, sorry, my favourite band, growing up in the 90s, The Cause, up at the Sunshine Coast. Some of you are familiar, yes? Sam Van Domley, good to see you, mate. And... Uh, this morning, I, I wanted to continue sharing around this topic of better together and particularly around the theme of worship with one another. And I wanted to read from Exodus 17 this morning and it says, The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron and Hur went to the top of the hill. Let's, let's pray this morning. Jesus, we welcome you here. Lord, we know that you're here. We can feel it in our spirits this morning. And I just thank you, Lord, that as I share this morning around my experience at the loss of my sister, that you would just be with me. Lord, that you would just, that my tongue would be the pen of a ready writer and that any words of Kim would just fall to the side and Lord, that you would speak to hearts this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Has anyone uh, had, a, had a year that's absolutely crushed you? <laughs> Maybe this year or previous years, just raise your hand. I mean, that's tremendous. It's not tremendous, but it makes me feel better. I felt like I'd be sharing and my life and just bleeding out on stage alone for everyone to witness. And um, so it's nice to have some support here this morning. But... Uh, this would be one of the heaviest, most difficult years of my life, without a doubt. So seven months ago, on the 24th of March, I got a call from my oldest sister, Kirsty, and she was calling to let me know that my 39-year-old sister, Amy, was being moved into intensive care at Lismore Base Hospital. Uh, last November in 2022, I, I received a call from Amy, her and Anthony, who we honoured so well this morning, were leading the Lamb Yamba location of our church. And in November 2021, she'd given birth to a third boy, my nephew Joey. And since having Joey, she had some health issues. She had some back pain, she had numb feet, she had some other things going on. And so she told the hospital and they referred her to a physio who said, um, maybe just do some exercises, maybe... This sort of thing can happen with nerves after birth. So do some of these exercises. Maybe, maybe do some Pilates. Try that trampoline one. That looks like fun. And you should see some improvement over time. And about a year went by and she was doing the exercises but nothing was changing. And so she went to a doctor again who this time ordered scans. And so last November she was calling to say that she was in Lismore Hospital that they had found a tumour on her spine and some other spots in her body. 
which would explain some of the issues she'd been having. But, you know, it was all going to be okay because at 39 years of age, she was still strong enough. I mean, she'd been doing Pilates, right? So she should get through this. And so as a brother, as a believer of Jesus, I hear this news and, and I pray and I say, thank you, God, that you're going to heal my sister. And our Yamba Church and our Ballina Church and Byron Church were all amazing. People cooked meals, they mowed lawns, they prayed, they encouraged her and her family, they encouraged me and my family. Basically, a lot of people were invested in this journey and helped out practically, spiritually, emotionally. And all the while, Amy went, she got her treatments, she'd have good days, she'd have not good days, until it all culminated in her being admitted back into hospital in March this year. And I remember I went up on the Thursday, and I'd just started a new job, so I was working while she pretty much slept the whole time. And I spoke with Tones, and Tones was saying, you know, the doctors are quite hopeful of starting a new treatment on Monday, so things are looking okay. And so she woke up for a bit, and I, I left there just telling her I was proud of her, to be her brother, that I loved her, and I'd see her soon. So I woke up the next morning, the Friday, and and was just going about my business when my sister Kirsty called and said she'd been moved to intensive care. So straight away I got on the phone to Dad, who lives five minutes away, and I said, Dad, I'll get dressed, I'll get ready, and we'll head up there and we'll just be there in case we have the opportunity to see her, right? And so he said, yeah, that sounds good. So I started getting ready, and just as I was about to leave the house, a bit before 8 o'clock, I got a call from my dad crying. And in between sobs, he was just calling to say that my 39-year-old sister had just passed away. And my world was rocked. I guess, as you would expect, the past seven months have been a really challenging time. And it's, it's been a time where my whole world of faith and emotion has just been challenged to its core. There's this Psalm 77.3. And it sums up where my head has been pretty consistently this year. And it says, I heard your name, God, and I groaned. Another translation says, I heard the name of God and I was troubled. And I was troubled because I knew that God could heal. You know, I had been growing up in church. I'd heard the Bible verses of a healing God. I'd heard stories and testimonies of healing, of deliverance, you know, his, this, in my perspective, was an easy one for God. A young woman, 39, strong, had cancer. Lots of people were watching on. Lots of people were invested. We pray, she gets healed. What a testimony for Jesus, right? Simple equation. Yet the reality of my situation didn't align with that. And I found myself pretty much on this exact spot a week later at my sister's funeral telling stories about her. And I just found myself really emotional about it all. And as odd as it sounds, all this emotion took me by surprise. Because honestly, I've, I've never been one to be in touch with my feelings. Beth would be the first one to attest to that. You know, I've never really wanted to or been in tune with my feelings or how my emotions can actually affect my greater world. And Peter Scazzaro, who's a pastor in America, talks about how he felt in his younger years due to a range of factors such as his personality, um, his development, societal expectations, his perception of God that he's found over the years, that being upset or depressed, even grieving too much, was a sign of being ungodly or unspiritual. And I found myself reading that and identifying massively with that. Because I think due to a range of things, if you were to scratch the surface, it mirrored my own thoughts. And I, I look back and I remember moments in my life where I've found intense pain, such as hearing my mum had cancer in 2010. 19 days later, she passed away from cancer. These moments where there's intense emotion, intense pain, and, and be, because I wouldn't know really how to deal with it, I, I think I did what a lot of 
stereotypical Aussie men did. And I take all this sadness, this anger, this disappointment, this feeling and emotion, and I just push it down into my spirit, open this little door in my spirit and kick it in there and say, just stay in there. Because, you know, I need to be strong. I'm a man and Jesus is still on the throne, right? (laughs) And because I wouldn't know how or allow myself to feel the feelings or even validate my emotions, I think ultimately I would live on this surface level behind walls that I had put up. People would say, how are you going? And I'd say, okay, you know, rejoice in the Lord always. This is life, huh? Living from this front of looking okay without truly being okay. And so when Amy passed away, I found this initial intense wave of emotions hitting me and I found myself tempted to almost revert back to that way of dealing with pain. But pretty early on, I made this decision that I didn't want to bury this. I wanted to allow this pain to stop me and in stopping me, allow me to work through what I was feeling, including all of the disappointment I felt in a real way. I remember praying prayers to God Or maybe it was more me speaking at God than with God. And I would express my disappointment, how I felt he'd really missed a chance on this one, how I was sad, how I was angry, how I just feel like this was a missed opportunity. And in reply, I'd wait. And would I get some amazing revelation about the heart of God? Did a Bible verse come to mind? Did some amazing prophetic word drop from the sky into my lap? It didn't. Because truthfully, it felt at times like I was all alone in this, just talking to thin air, unable to connect my pain with what seemed to be a far or distant off God. And I've looked into it over the past seven months and so many scholars call these moments after a life event of pain and, and hurt The journey through walls. St. John of the Cross calls it the dark night of the soul. And it's centered around this thought that sometimes difficult, complex or painful things happen to us that challenge us. And these challenges or battles as they're sometimes known as can rattle us emotionally, spiritually and leave us with one of two choices. Either God, you're not what I thought, forget you. Or God, you're not what I thought, help me through this. I want to know you more. Because I think I knew the right things theologically, but emotionally I wasn't doing well. But I decided no matter how alone I felt, how dry, how dark, I wanted to take this time to give God an opportunity. Or else I had the risk of living my entire life on this surface level without the full gamut of human emotion for the rest of my life because I knew further pain was inevitable. We read verses like in John 16 and Jesus himself says, in this world you will have trouble. There's no option. It's not like you tick a box to opt in to trouble or pain or hurt or disappointment. It's a guarantee. In this life you will experience hurt, you will experience loss and you will experience disappointment. And some of you may be here and you have lost a loved one and you can identify with that. But maybe some of you can't identify with what I'm saying this morning in terms of the loss of a loved one. But maybe you've experienced hurt or disappointment in other ways. The loss of a relationship, an affair, a health diagnosis or a mental health condition a disappointment in your career or just something else that has totally shaken your beliefs and your foundation. But how do we as believers work through or come out of these battles choosing to draw nearer to God and not further away? And this book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality speaks of leaning into pain. And in that pain, inviting and allowing God to highlight areas of our lives that are emotionally or spiritually broken and intentionally exploring how we can open pathways to healing. Because I believe we need to be able to reconcile and process our humanity and all of our feelings with our faith. Because the more we know ourselves, the more we can understand and know 
and relate to God, which in turn allows us to find our true identity, which is in Jesus Christ, and live our most authentic lives and live genuinely and connect both to our family, our friends, and even to God. And I think it also allows us to walk alongside and genuinely equip other people who are going through hurt and pain in a godly way because the more I looked at it, the more I realised that our society, our culture doesn't do pain great. You know, it gives us band-aid solutions for dealing with pain and it often involves things like binging or addiction. You know, I'll, I'll watch this TV show or I'll abuse this substance or I'll game or I'll, I'll just look on my phone constantly or I'll eat. Or we can suppress things. We keep busy. We work a little bit more. We, we push these feelings down and we don't engage or in the difficult work or in the difficult conversations. And we find that we're just numbing ourselves. And in doing that, we find that those relationships that are closest to us, our families, our friends, and even our relationship with Jesus can become complicated. And so I've tried to give God space to move and found this year in being real and vulnerable and allowing myself to sit in these feelings and the hurt that I was feeling from the sudden loss of my mum and also my sister, that I've allowed God to really highlight some coping patterns in my life that weren't healthy, that internalised pain and emotion which put up walls around me for, and didn't allow me to be my authentic self for, for fear of being that sad guy in the corner at a party. And this year has involved a battle for me of leaning into pain, working on communicating where I'm at constantly and saying and experiencing all those awkward words that I hate to say. You know, things like vulnerability and feelings and emotions and, and these catch cries like validation and naming and expressing and just being comfortable understanding that I can communicate how I'm feeling at each and every moment and being comfortable this year at being uncomfortable in my emotions, in my thoughts, in my faith, in my conversations and interactions at times. And maybe you can identify with this and it feels like you're fighting a battle for your mind, your heart, your emotions, your spirit. And in this passage we read this morning, the Israelite army, they're also in a battle. And we can see that the Amalekites came to them and they attacked them. And Moses says to Joshua, we're going to fight them, but I'm going to go up to the top of the hill with my big stick and uh, we'll hope for the best, right? And it says, so Joshua fought the army. And we pick it up in verse 11 and it says... Moses is up on top of the hill, and as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. Were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army. Every time Moses lifted his hands, they started winning the battle. But every time Moses got tired, fatigued, just lost the passion and lowered his hands, they started losing the battle. And you may find yourself right now in the middle of a battle this morning, in the very reality of a betrayal, of hurt, pain, divorce, disappointment, relationship issues, addictions, health, financial stuff, who knows? Let me encourage you this morning. Just like Moses in this passage, our battles are won in lifting our hands and surrendering ourselves to God in worship. Phil Pringle says, your emotions are the slave, not the master. And I've learned that this year, that our emotions reveal our pain but God guides the healing. Because our emotions reveal pain and, and they're valid and they need to be acknowledged. But God guides our healing. And when we submit to him, he sets our path for healing. And for me, it's involved at times this year just saying, 
I'm committed to you, Jesus. Despite my emotions, despite my feelings, I don't understand. I'm incredibly sad. I'm jaded. I'm confused. But like it says in the book of Isaiah, your ways are higher than my ways. Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. And I surrender to that mystery. So I will come to church when I don't feel like it. I will lift my hands to you when I don't feel like it. I'll wake up in the morning, I'll try praying, even if I'm having a bad day. Because winning our battles comes when we lift our hands in worship to Jesus, despite the pain, despite the hurt, despite the confusion. Colossians 3.23, which Anthony just said, says, Whatever you do, do it all to the Lord and not to men. See, worship is our life. It's not just some songs we sing on a Sunday morning, but it's how we give honour to God when we speak and interact with our kids, when we speak and interact with our partner, with our friends. It's honouring God when we drive our car, (laughs) which is difficult for me. It's how well we do our work. It's how we live our life. Worship is us surrendering ourselves in everything and just giving our all to Jesus who gave his all for us. And just like this passage this morning, the reality is we need each other. We are better together. Because as much as I have tried, I couldn't have lifted my hands in worship this year by myself. In my human frailty, over time my arms would have become tired, they would have fallen But this year, like Moses, I know in the midst of my hurt that I've felt the strength from coming to church, from having others help me lift my hands when I've been struggling. You know, only a few weeks back we went on this camping trip and when I say camping, they camped, other people camped. (laughs) Me and Beth stayed in a really nice like little unit, (laughs) had two TVs, air conditioning, rained the second night and we were like, oh... Imagine camping here. (laughs) And I think it was maybe on on that first day or so, I remember just sitting down on a camp chair and one of our friends was like, how are you going? It's been a pretty bad year. And, you know, I've been asked that so much this year and previously, like when mum passed away, I would find myself saying, you know, I'm okay. It sucks. This is life. Just got to get on with it. But... This year, I'm I'm trying to be intentional around leaning in to be willing to be uncomfortable in engaging with my feelings and my emotions and learning. And, And I'm surrendering and I'm finding that I'm actually trying to let people into my world a little bit more and let my hands be lifted by other people. And so I explained this year and the pain that I'd felt this year that I felt so confused by Jesus, that I identified so much with this dad in Mark 9 who brings his son to Jesus to be healed. And Jesus looks at him and says, do you believe? And the dad just looks at Jesus and says, I believe, but help with my unbelief. And this conundrum that I was constantly experiencing in my life of this confusion of my faith, where I was at constantly, and And I felt like that was just the perfect snapshot of my life at the moment. And it just felt so empowering to just lay it out there with my friends in a safe place, with people who love Jesus and love me. And not have this pressure just to have it all together, but just to be able to bear my soul a little bit and be vulnerable. Because one thing I noticed is that they didn't attack me. (laughs) They didn't even try solving anything. You know, they just put a hand on my shoulder or an understanding voice and just loved and accepted me. And I found spending time with friends this year, Jesus-loving friends, to be incredibly helpful. Just allowing people into my world to truly care for me in a hug, in a cooked meal, a hand on my shoulder, an encouraging word, a prayer, a laugh, or just allowing people to be there. I found the ability to be with people and And just have awkward moments of being vulnerable where I ramble. I've realized as I get older that I'm like my dad. And I hear my dad rambling and I'm like, I feel like I'm becoming my dad. And 
the more I ramble, it's funny because the more clarity I'm finding around what I'm actually feeling. I was like, why couldn't I have a dad that's a bit more succinct? <laughs> I reached my word limit at like 9.30 in the morning and I'm like, I'm tapping out for the day. <laughs> but more than anything, I've found it healing to come to church each week. To walk into that courtyard and be greeted with people smiling at me. To have a cup of tea that the hospitality team has put on. You know, to walk through these doors up back and hear Craig before I see him and hear him saying, hi, Kim. <laughs> Just being here and being with all of you, my people, it's been special. Maybe it's talking with... Craig or Doug last week about my handyman skills or lack thereof and just laughing afterwards. Maybe it's just talking or getting a hug from 100 different people on a Sunday or, or a kiss on my forehead from Luke Halverson. <laughs> and you know, always at the end of these things, just you guys looking at me and saying, how are you going? It's been healing to stand side by side by each of you and Sing Shout to the Lord last week, which they sang at my sister's funeral. And just be crying on the front row in a safe place, knowing I can be vulnerable here. And that I don't have to present this front of having it all together. Or go away with friends I met in church as a 16-year-old. We all put our kids to bed at night and we sit late into the night having a whiskey or having a tea. And just laughing. Usually it's someone else's expense in the group and having big laughs and then just having conversations that clarify and allow me just to articulate my feelings a little bit more and putting them into words and find that while I'm saying it, my, ears, my eyes are welling up with tears and, and then feeling a little bit unhinged and a little bit emotionally unstable and then laughing again about how much of an emotional wreck I am and... It's just been special, something special this year that has reinforced to me how much better we are together and how we are designed to worship with one another and bear each other's burdens. I might get Kim to come up on the keyboard. I, I always think that Jeff's talking to me when he says it and I'll, chopsticks, sure. <laughs> You'll have to teach me a pad or two one day so when he says it, I'll get up and he'll just be freaking out on the inside <laughs> and then I'll just set the Holy Spirit, man. It'll just be... But I remember one morning um, while we're camping after one of these big nights of laughing, crying, all that stuff and I went for a run and something inside of me just felt a little bit lighter. And I ran over this big bridge with lots of water and it was a cloudy day and I ran along this path and I found myself at the edge of this path just looking over a bay, dark water, big breeze in my face. And I just closed my eyes and I, I tried to just exhale. Like I've been trying to do most mornings, just exhaling and saying, Jesus, be with me today. Getting rid of some of that pain and hurt. And in return, I just felt this knowing that God was with me. That He loved me. He hasn't been absent during this year's darkest moments. He's cried with me for the pain I'm feeling. But ultimately in that moment, I had a knowing that God was with me. And this verse from Job came to mind and it's from Job 42.5 and it just says, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you.
just knowing that this year was changing me. But being genuine and honest before God and before people, I was allowing him in in a new way to heal me. And worshipping with others this year, despite how disappointed and hurt I've been, and still am, just knowing in my spirit that I hadn't just heard of God, but I'd seen him. I have felt incredibly loved and cared for this year by all of you. And I want to thank you for being with me, for lifting my hands when it's felt hard. Even when it's felt impossible at times, I'm so grateful. And I know that this is, <laughs> this is different to what you normally get from me. And if that makes you uncomfortable, I am sorry. But I'll probably be back to normal next time. I feel like I could have gotten up here. I could have told a story. I could have told some analogies. We could have laughed. We could have prayed. We could have walked out of here thinking, what's for lunch? But in the true sense of this year, I feel like I wanted to be intentional around my inner vulnerabilities and share where I'm at and the journey that I'm been on and I'm currently on. I'm still smack bang in the midst of this, as you can probably tell. But I feel that the more I'm letting people in, with wisdom, the more this fog is lifting in my life and the clearer I'm seeing Jesus working. Even in the saddest, most difficult places, I can look and my eyes see God. When I thought there was silence, there's been someone praying, someone encouraging. When I feel like I couldn't see God moving, there was a meal. When I thought there was absence, there's been a hug. Maybe you can identify with this message and you're in the midst of hurt or you've been hurting for some time, maybe even years. I would encourage you, just keep showing up. Keep leaning into God, even in the midst of the darkest pain. Keep coming to church. Open yourself up to the right Jesus-loving people to walk with you through the pain. Allow people to lift your hands when you can't lift them yourself. Or maybe God is speaking to you this morning and asking you to do the lifting. To walk alongside someone in pain this morning. We're here to bear each other's burdens. That's the beauty of church. You know, we're the hands, we're the feet of Jesus on this earth. And we can lift each other's hands and encourage each other in our pain to lean into God through the hurt and to love each other, to care. See, church isn't a place for the healthy. Church isn't the place for the unhealthy. Church is a place where the spiritually dead come to life. Where there was no hope, we join together around worship and we lift each other's hands when it seems like we can't do it ourselves in the most difficult times of our lives because we are truly better together. Why don't we stand in this place this morning? I want to pray for everyone here this morning. Maybe you're here and like me, you've been facing a battle or you're facing a battle and you're hurting and would love some prayer. Or maybe you feel like you want to stand alongside someone this morning. I'd love to just pray with you with every eye closed. And if you're comfortable lifting your hands as a sign of surrender. Jesus, we love you. Lord, we thank you for the power that's in the name of Jesus, that your spirit is here. Lord, we thank you for every single person and their hearts, their spirits this morning. We just pray that you would open up pathways to healing this morning. Lord, we thank you that we have the opportunity to join together each week, to push our, our stuff to the side and lift up our hands, lift up our eyes and lift up our voices to the King of Kings, the creator of the universe. 
Lord, we just thank you. We're so grateful. And in this place, I just pray that you would touch lives, touch hearts, and that your spirit would be fresh this morning. Lord, we lift you up. We thank you that you are such a good God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Kim. Thank you for um, being real with us this morning. Thank you for the courage that you've shown. And, you know, that's life, isn't it? That we, we do go through these moments. And, and as Kim said, you know, we're here to walk alongside and lift up the arms of those who need to. Or maybe you need help having your arms lifted this morning. So if that's you, would love to pray with you this morning. I'm sure Kim would be happy to, any of the team here. But as the service finishes up, feel free to come down for prayer so that we can stand alongside you and lift your arms. Or, you know, maybe it's some, you want somebody else's arms lift up. There might be someone on your heart that we can pray for this morning. But thank you, Jesus, for all that you're doing in our church. Thank you, Jesus, that you are with us and that you care and that you walk alongside us. And so this week, God, we hand it over to you and we say, help us. May we have a sense of you in our every day as we walk through life. In Jesus' mighty name, we say thank you. Amen. Amen. Have a great week. We look forward to seeing you next week. But please come down for prayer if you'd like that this morning.